In yesterday's episode, we discovered the location of Vault 92 after scouring the ruins of the vault Tech headquarters. The directions pointed us to the old Alni area of the Capital Wasteland, which is today a ruined town infested by Death Claws. We were sent to Vault 92 by an old woman named Agatha. She asked us to retrieve her great-great-grandmother Hilda's old violin, an antique called the Swa Stradivarius. During our conversation, she told us a little bit about Vault 92, but she didn't know much. All she said was that the vault was dedicated to preserving the musical talent of pre-war America. As an accomplished violinist, Hilda was admitted to Vault 92, but that's where her story ends. What actually happened there is a mystery. To find Vault 92, we can leave Old Olney and head due west. Eventually, we see a big pile of rocks, and the earth slopes down, creating a path between them. At the end of the path, we see a big wooden door. This is the hidden entrance to Vault 92. Inside, we see the dust of ages floating through the air. It's possible that Wastelanders might have taken refuge in this entryway cave at some point. We find tin cans and milk bottles littering the entrance. But the strange thing about this vault is as we approach the door, the door is open but it's not ruined. If we activate the switch just outside the door, it rolls in place. Since these vault controls were securely locked by vault Tech after the bombs dropped, this tells us that the vault was opened from the inside. Perhaps the original dwellers escaped, or perhaps they were convinced to open the door by people with evil intent. Heading through the door, we immediately see a table filled with all sorts of goodies. A laser pistol, energy cells, a blood pack, fission batteries, and two first aid kits. That's a whole lot of gear to find right at the entrance. I wonder why it was here. Heading up the stairs and turning right, we see a little check-in room that's typical in these vaults, but this one is blocked up with shelving units. Sharon heard something moving around on the other side of the main door, so he went ahead and opened it to kill a bloat fly. Before entering the the vault, I wanted to finish exploring this entryway, so moving to the northeast, we see a couple of tables covered with ruined terminals, but on one of them, we find a holotape. Professor Malleus Audiolog V9201. So far, the experiment is going exactly as planned. We are subjecting the residents to extremely low frequency white noise in regular intervals through the loudspeaker system. Using the soundproof recording studios and the musicians was an inspired idea. <laughs> Kudos to the vault Tech Selection Committee on their shrewdness. Now as we pass through the main door, we had to deactivate a proximity mine. This is our first clue that something bad must have happened here. We find three doors in this room. To the south, a door leading to the atrium. To the east, a door leading to the lab and classroom. And to the west, an unmarked door. It looks like whatever placard had been on this light has since fallen off. First, let's go to the atrium. We open the door to find another room guarded by a rigged shotgun. But the strange thing about this is that the tripwire attached to it is on the ground by the door at the opposite end of the room. If these vault dwellers were trying to protect themselves from outside invasion, you'd think the shotgun would be pointed the other way. But no, whoever set up this rigged shotgun was trying to protect himself from dangers within the vault. Opening the door brings us to the hallway, and the first thing we see is a skeleton lying on the ground next to an empty metal box and a note right by his hand titled Feedback Loops. Okay. Pass this on after you get it. Gotta keep this crap off the intravault mails. If you can hack the control panels, use their noise flush feature to spook the crazies. Works okay and it's kept me alive these last two days, but they're starting to catch on. We need to get organized and make an attempt for the vault door. It's our only chance. So, some of the vault dwellers did try to escape, but from what? This poor fellow on the ground here must have failed, but presumably some succeeded since we found the door open. The note mentioned crazies. Are the crazies invaders? Or could it be that some of their own members became crazy? To continue, we go down a staircase, at the bottom of which we find another frag mine. This hallway ends at an average locked door. Unlocking it leads to the atrium, which is infested with bloat flies. Hey. 
After killing all the blood flies, we can explore this atrium to discover the remains of some sort of battle. We find skeletons lying on the ground with centuries old blood splatter still smearing the floor. The residents had used the tables in this atrium as barriers. There are many doors on this ground floor. Let's explore the clinic to the southwest first. Inside, we find a locker on the ground with 50 bottle caps and some recon armor. There are three more lockers to the northwest, but they're empty. Heading out, we can then go through the southeastern door. This leads to one closed off room. There's no way out of here, but we do find two skeletons huddled together to the northeast. They are surrounded by what is presumably their own blood splatter. We find another poor soul just outside this room on the ground behind more tables and chairs used as a shield. Next, let's try going through the southern door. At the end of a twisting hallway, we find a staircase that leads up to the second level of the atrium. On this level, we find three more doors. The door to the northwest leads to an empty room, so going across the catwalk, we find a skeleton on the ground before the door to the northeast. The store is locked with an average lock. After picking it, we find a store. It's mostly picked clean, but we still find a few goodies. There are some energy cells on a shelf and some minor junk on the others. Behind the counter, we find some darts on a bottom shelf and two ammunition boxes. Beneath the boxes on the bottom shelf is a copy of Tales of a Junktown Jerky Vendor. On the counter, we find the supply shop terminal, but it's locked with an average lock. After hacking it, we find three vault intramails and the option to unlock a wall safe. The first message was from Gordy Sumner to Richard Rubin, the overseer of Vault 92. Gordy Sumner must have been the owner of this terminal. He says, This is the fifth time I've requested that you allow me to release our supply of headphones and personal audio listening gear to the residents. It seems unfair that residents are required to listen to their music selections in this studio rooms. I have an ample supply of the type of equipment that would allow most residents to relax in their beds and enjoy their musical recordings. Please let me know your reasons behind this matter. So this is a musician's vault, but they weren't allowed to listen to music in their bedrooms? That seems strange. Clearly Gordy agreed if he sent this email to the overseer. And the next one, Gordy sent an intra mail to all vault residents. I am pleased to announce that we now have strawberry pudding available in the vault store for 10 work credits. The supply is very limited, of course, so hurry down and get some before it's all gone. Oh, even after the apocalypse, Vault Dwellers had some tasty luxuries. The final message is from shop owner Gordy to Dan Kabacheski. From your last mill, it seems we have a deal. I'll give you everything on your list in exchange for the weapon we discussed. Things are getting worse in this vault with almost half of the residents going crazy. I just want to be prepared. Don't worry, I'll lock the gun in my safe so no one can easily trace it back to your department. So it wasn't an external threat at all. The residents themselves were going crazy. What could have triggered almost half the vault residents to go mad? We can use the final option to unlock the safe, and sure enough, just as Gordy said in his terminal, we find a weapon. Two laser pistols to be exact, with a wide selection of ammunition and a small stash of chems. Heading out of the store, we can go south and through a door to an empty room. But this room leads to the overseer's office. Passing through, we find a door to the left, and it looks like this door had crushed someone. We find a body under the door, swimming in its own blood. And right next to this is another corpse lying on the floor. The door to the south is locked with a very easy lock, and picking it leads to a long hallway where we find more evidence of a battle. Tables and chairs turned into makeshift barriers. The door to the southeast leads to a bedroom. Here we find three beds and a couple of containers. Interestingly, the dressers in this room cannot be opened, which is strange, but at least the lockers can. But inside we don't find much. Heading out and opening the northeastern door leads to another bedroom with a similar situation. A dresser that can't be opened, but a few small containers that can. Next, we can head out and go into the southwestern room. And like the last two, we can't open these dressers, but we do find Professor Melius's audio log V9202 lying on a table with a blasted out terminal. I'm a bit encouraged by the latest batch of data. It seems that 33% of the subjects are now lapsing into a trance-like state on occasion. When in this state, we're fairly certain that suggestion and programming of the subject can be applied. 
We've begun testing this by implanting subtle cues in affected subjects, making them scratch their ear or constantly fix their hair. So far, I'm happy to report a 100% success rate on this implementation method. Ah, so they were using the white noise as a way to induce a trance-like state in some of the vault dwellers. This is morally dubious, no, not even dubious, this is morally disgusting. But at least it seems harmless enough. I mean, all he's doing is have them scratch their ear or fix their hair. Could these rather harmless suggestions from the professor have led to the massacre that must have gone on here? To answer our question, we need to head through the western door. This leads to a hallway that loops around and ends at the overseer's office. To the south, we see a table upon which lies Richard Rubin's terminal. We remember from Gordy's terminal that Richard was the overseer of Vault 92, and lying next to this terminal is Professor Malleus's audio log V9203. Oh, disaster today. One of our test subjects, V920717, has murdered three other residents in a fit of unbridled rage, the likes of which I've never seen. It took almost 23 shots before the security team took him down. This subject has no history of violence or mental instability whatsoever. My concern is that this subject is one of our most successful implant recipients, able to execute complex instructions during a trance state. And now we begin to see where these crazies must have come from. Professor Malleus was implanting instructions into these vault dwellers using the white noise. And it looks like one of the residents who was most susceptible to suggestion became violent, going crazy. Perhaps the other crazies we've read about were more vault dwellers like this one who took to the implantations easily. But why go violent? This surprised Professor Malleus. Clearly this was not part of his experiment. Perhaps we can learn more by reading the Overseer's Terminal. But before we do, let's go ahead and grab this pre-war book on a shelf. Inside we find four entries and an option to open the Overseer's Tunnel. In the first one, as per instructions, the broadcast equipment for the white noise has been rerouted from the sound booths and tied directly into the entire vault's loudspeaker system. I'll now be able to execute vault Tech's confidential plan WNMSCE, White Noise Mind Suggestion Combat Experimentation. I have three of Professor Malleus's team doing what I need to get done and hope to show some concrete results soon. I had the engineers make it so the white noise can be either triggered from the control center or at the local security consoles. The password to these consoles is UIY2249. So it was the Overseer, using the white noise to program his residents with combat suggestions. And now we know why the Overseer wouldn't allow Gordy to sell headphones from his shop. The Overseer wanted everyone to be exposed to this white noise at all times. And you can't be exposed to white noise if you have something else plugged into your ears. In the next one, the results of the white noise mind suggestion combat experimentation are even better than I could have ever imagined. The sheer strength and tenacity of combat suggestion implanted test subjects is incredible. Imagine an entire army of people who would never disobey a direct order from high command and who can fight until it takes over 20 bullets to stop them. In the next one, Malleus says the white noise mind suggestion combat experimentation is a failure. So there's been a few deaths. One step back, two steps forward. It's easy to suppress what everyone in the vault are calling crazies. I've added a command word in their suggestion implants. Simply say the phrase, sanity is not statistical, and they will stop dead in their tracks. I've informed the guards of this, but I've told them only to use it when out of earshot of anyone else. Sanity is not statistical is a quote from George Orwell's novel 1984. The main character Winston said this phrase to show that sanity is not dictated by the majority. Even if the majority of people do one thing, that does not make their one thing sane. If one man differs from the majority, that doesn't necessarily make him insane. In the next one, the command phrase is no longer working against the crazies. I don't know what the hell happened, but I'm losing control of the situation. If we don't get things under control soon, we're gonna have a huge revolt on our hands. Malleus is inciting the rest of the vault into action. I'm afraid, by the power invested in me by the vault Corporation, I have no choice but to have him killed. What a waste. What a waste? 
What a fool. The overseer himself admits that he's losing control of the situation, and then he wants to kill the one man trying to get the rest of the vault dwellers to save themselves? What a nut job! And this is the guy who came up with the command phrase, sanity is not statistical, how ironic. But this note gives us a possible author for the flood control note that we found lying on the ground near to a skeleton. If Dr. Malleus was trying to organize people, perhaps he was doing so with written notes outside of the intramel. We can then choose the final option to open the overseer's tunnel. Oops, looks like I forgot to loot a stealth boy that was on the desk. Around in the corner, we can jump up and down, and there we go. Heading down the steps into the overseer's tunnel, we can open a door to sound testing. But this leads us to what looks like a reactor room. Here we find a few goodies laid out, a laser pistol with an ammo box to the southwest, and then going around the perimeter of this room, we find the door, but it's jammed shut. Looks like there's some sort of shelving unit stuck underneath it. Well, continuing around, we find a safe to the southeast, locked with an easy lock. Inside, we find a Chinese pistol with a bunch of ammunition caps and some whiskey. On top is another ammo container. And it looks like we've hit a dead end, but if we listen carefully, we can hear something walking on the other side of the door. Is that a Mirelurk? What's a Mirelurk doing in a vault? Well, we have no choice but to retrace our steps. Heading back through the tunnel, we can leave the overseer's office and re-enter the atrium. Hopping down to the ground floor of the atrium, we can now choose another path to explore. This time, we'll head through the northwestern door to explore the living quarters. But as soon as we enter the living quarters, we get attacked by a slew of Mirelurks. Had enough? Good grief, they just kept coming and coming. After they're dead, we can go down this southern path, but this leads to a dead end. We can look through some windows, however, into what must have been a kitchen or cafe of some sort. Retracing our steps and rounding the corner, we find a wall-mounted terminal to the right, right next to the female dorm. This is the women's dorm security terminal. We need to be careful, though. Our perception tells us on our compass that there's another enemy to the northwest. Reading the terminal, we find four intercom options and a noise flush. The first one, intercom operator, doesn't work because the operator is unavailable. If we choose any of the other options, general services, kitchen, or climate control, we get error 862. Please speak with the operator. The only option we have is noise flush, and when we select it, We hear some white noise static and notice that the red marker on my compass disappeared. This noise flush must be the same noise flush option that the professor talked about in the note that we found on the ground. He said it would drive the crazies back, but does it also work on Mirelurks? Could the white noise have scared the remaining Mirelurks on this level? We need to explore further to get answers. Heading north to explore the women's dorm, we find some boxes with minor loot to the northwest and a first aid kit on the wall. This leads to a door to the north, which is the primary female dorm. There's a doorway to the northeast, which leads to a small supply closet. Here we find a box of mines on the bottom of a shelf, a bunch of containers, and then a wall safe, but the wall safe is empty. Looks like someone beat us to it. Heading out, we can explore more of the lockers by the bunk beds, and then we see a door to the bathroom to the west with a dead mire lurk. Well, we didn't kill this guy, but he did die recently. He must have died when we turned on the white noise. The white noise must have had some strange effect on the mire lurk that killed him. The stalls are empty, but we do find the skeleton of a woman to the southwest. She's still clutching a teddy bear, telling us that perhaps 
This was a young virtuoso, maybe a young teenager, who was admitted to this vault because of her amazing musical prowess. Well, she no longer needs her teddy bear, so we can take it for little Marie. That's it for the women's dorm, so backing out, we can go across the hallway to what looks like a game room. We find a vault tech lunchbox on a table, a pool table on the opposite end, and it connects to the east to a small little cafeteria. Here we just find some darts and minor loot. Opening the door to the west leads to a hallway next to the male dorm. Here we find another security terminal, which remember we unlocked after getting a password from the overseer's terminal. And this has all the same options as the women's security terminal, including a noise flush. I went ahead and tagged it just in case to make sure we've cleared out these mire lurks. Exploring the men's dorm, we find a first aid kit under one of the tables. And like the women's dorm, we find a bunch more bunk beds and lockers. Opening a door to the north leads to the bathroom. In one of the stalls, we find a plunger, not that interesting. But in the final stall, we find a piece of paper lying on the ground behind the toilet. This is a sheet music book, which I suppose is fitting for this kind of vault. Checking our Pip-Boy, we find it in the miscellaneous section, and it doesn't really do anything. What could this be for? Heading out of the bathroom, we see another dead Mirelurk. Good thing I did that noise flush. And lying on the ground is a skeleton next to an assault rifle. Opening the door to the south, we find a supply closet, but lying on the ground next to a rigged shotgun on a nearby shelf is a skeleton. Looking on the ground, we see that the tripwire has already fired. Perhaps by the man whose corpse we find lying on the ground near the assault rifle. Maybe this man in the closet had set up this trap to protect himself, and he succeeded in killing the crazy who tried to attack him, but not before the crazy killed him. After disarming the rigged shotgun, we can loot a laser pistol on the box with some ammunition, and on the ground next to the corpse is a key code to data storage, which looks like a red pass card right next to a note. John Adiglio's note. I'm cut off and I don't know if anyone sane is left, so I've locked myself in this closet on B-level. If anyone finds this note, let my family know I didn't go crazy like the rest of this place. Let them know that I died with dignity when and where I decided. There's no way I'm gonna let the crazies tear me apart. I can't die like that. To my wife and kids, I love you all. This note almost reads like he committed suicide. We do find that laser pistol. Perhaps he set up this rigged shotgun and then committed suicide. A few hours later, one of the crazies opened the door and tripped on the tripwire. After looting a locked ammo crate next to this guy, we can turn to unlock an easy locked wall safe to the west. Inside we find some caps, pre-war money, and a stealth boy. Heading out of the men's dorm to the hallway, we have two paths ahead of us. We can go north or we can go south. Let's go south first. We find a staircase leading down to a basement level. Here we find more Mirelurk corpses that we killed using the noise flush. And this leads to a hallway where we find two skeletons. Looking through a nearby window. Ooh, we got a Nuka-Cola Quantum over there. Let's see if we can go find it. Heading through the door, we go down a short hallway to open another door to the south, which leads to a room with more dead Mirelurks. Going west, we enter what must be some sort of security room. We find a few blasted out terminals and a small assortment of supplies on some of these shelves, including some darts. The lockers are all empty, but we do find that Nuka-Cola Quantum we saw earlier. And here we find the security terminal. Here we find three options, allow access, deny access, or noise flush. Choosing allow access first doesn't seem to really do anything, but then again, we already opened the door to this area, so instead, let's try deny access. This option closes the door and sets off an incendiary trap in the hallway. Suddenly we realize how those two people died in the hallway. We can choose allow access to open the door again, and then noise flush. <laughs> we, we again hear the noise, and it looks like one of the heads on the Mirelurks exploded, even though the Mirelurk was already dead. With this room explored, we can go east. We find a couple of options before us. We can loot some boxes and ammo containers on the shelf to the west, and then go through the northeastern door. Here we find quite a selection of explosives. We find pulse mines on one table and pulse grenades on another. 
These are some intense munitions for a vault dedicated to classical music. Heading out and turning southeast, we find a locked door, but we can open it with that data storage entry passcode key card that we found next to the body of John Adiglio. Or if we didn't get the card, we can always hack this hard locked terminal. If we're successful, we find the option to unlock the data storage room, or we can just go ahead and use the key. Inside, we find more munitions, railway spikes, ammunition canisters, Stealth boys, microfusion cells, energy cells, right away, blood packs. But you know, this does make sense. After all, we learned from the Overseer's terminal that it was vault idea to use the white noise to program these people into combat. And what good is having a bunch of brainwashed vault dwellers who are good at combat if they don't have any weapons? Heading out of this room, on a table to the southwest, we find Professor Melius's audio log V9204. Unbelievable! We've had 12 more incidents in the past month mirroring Subject V92071's actions. The shocking part is the savagery these aberrants exhibit when they murder. They rip their victims apart limb from limb and eviscerate them by hand. These used to be respected members of the musical community. How could this be happening? Where have I gone wrong? Even at this late point, poor Professor Malleus doesn't realize that his experiment has been hijacked by the Overseer. That the Overseer, under vault instructions, is giving them violent orders. The room next to this table must have been a small clinic. On a table, we find a DC Journal of Internal Medicine, and we see some medical equipment and a few patient beds. Here we find the laboratory terminal, and inside, four notes. The first note was from Professor John Malleus to Section 4 Lab Assistants. Congratulations on a job well done, everyone. It seems like the current white noise tests are complete successes, with less than a 1% margin of error. We still have much to do analyzing the data, but I think all of you deserve a pat on the back for excellent work. Let's keep it up. In the next one, from Professor John Malleus to the Overseer Richard Rubin, here's the data on subject V92-0717, as requested. We are completely baffled as to why someone would behave in this manner after being subjected to the white noise experiments. As soon as our autopsy is complete, we will try to piece together why he went insane. I'm sorry about this, Rick. We'll get to the bottom of it soon. John was taking this hard. He took responsibility for his test subject without realizing that the overseer himself was responsible. In the next one, from John to Richard, we have a serious problem on our hands, and you have yet to answer my last several intravault mails or even see me. I have seven more dead. Three other Vault 92 residents have suffered the same symptoms as Subject V92-0717. How many more of these people have to die before you realize we're in deep trouble? We're alone out here. No one will come to our rescue. If anyone is even left, we have to deal with this ourselves. Please, I need you to see me immediately and call your goon squad off your living area doors. In the final one, from John to Richard, Section 4 is under heavy guard now. I can't even get in without a personal escort. It's my estimate that over 30% of the vault's entire population is now clinically insane and poses a real danger to the rest of us. We have to consider the possibility we may need to abandon the vault completely. Better to take a chance outside than in here. You still won't speak to me, and any attempt I've made to see you has ended in scuffles with your guards. It's obvious something's going on, and I'm gonna find out what. I just can't fathom how the Overseer could be so obtuse at this point. With nearly half the population going crazy getting weapons and attacking the other half, what could he possibly gain by continuing the silent treatment, by ignoring Professor John, by refusing to allow them to evacuate? There's just no logic here. Well, this leads to a dead end, so to continue exploring, we can retrace our steps and go north down the hallway outside the male dorms to the utility wing. On the other side, we go up some stairs and get attacked by some bloat flies. We see a sign on the wall pointing towards the clinic and cafeteria. There's a door leading to the north and a door leading to the east. We'll try going north first. We see a door to the reactor level on the other side of this room. There's not much here but rubble and trash everywhere, so opening the door to the reactor brings us to a hallway that leads us down two flights of stairs into waist-deep water. Oh, this is why we've got mire lurks. 
the reactor level has flooded. And sure enough, as we open the door, we have to fight our way through some mire alerts. Opening the southern door, we've got a Myrlurk hunter to kill. Passing through this reactor room, we enter a room to the south, where we find a couple of ammunition canisters on top of a shipping crate, and we can then head east. At the end of this long flooded hallway, we find another Marler King, and to the north, we find the engineering logs terminal. Inside, we find five trouble tickets. In ticket number seven, we learn that the engineer was named Carl Maynard. This ticket was about a lighting issue on B level. Fix notes. If I told Zack once, I've told him a thousand times. Stop using the higher ambitch ballasts and the lighting grid on B-level. They'll overheat within days and blow out because the power taps up there weren't installed to spec. I had to replace 37 ballasts with type K09A ballasts and use a power tap converter on each one. Billing my missed dinner with that sexy redhead violinist up in women's dorm 7 to Zack's work credit account. Ah, uh, poor old Carl. Might have missed out on the love of his life. In Ticket 8, we see that the issue was about Section 4 security upgrades, but the fix notes have been overwritten. The only one with the power to overwrite is presumably the Overseer. This ticket might have something to do with the installation of the noise flush on the dorm-level security terminals. In ticket number nine, we see that this one was issued to Carl's co-worker, Zach Foxworthy. The issue was about an odd smell in the air conditioning system. This was nasty. Seems when vault built this place, they decided to go ahead and parallel route the waste disposal dumping system with the air conditioning ducts. In some places, the ductwork is corroding, which has spread to the waste pipes. So now we have the waste products leaking into the venting. The airflow through the ducts is carrying the smell into most of men's dormitory 1, 2, and 5. Had to climb in there and patch it all up. In Ticket 10, this issue was about vault deterioration on D-level, given to Carl Maynard. Fix notes, ongoing. I have stress fractures and water seepage in three areas on D-level. I can only conclude that there's an adjoining underground spring or lake that is putting pressure on the concrete walls. I have already patched the stress fractures and used the metal plating that we normally use for flooring to shore it up for now. I recommend we get all the engineers together on this issue and come up with some sort of more permanent solution. Otherwise, we'll be knee-deep in nasty groundwater or worse. Well, it seems like the or worse part of Carl's prediction came true. I doubt he would have been able to imagine Myra lurks. vault really dropped the ball here. For a company as wealthy as vault and with as much political clout, you'd think they'd be able to find a suitable spot to run their experiments, not spots that get flooded with water. But of course, this isn't the first time. A similar thing happened with Vault 19. Remember from my video on Vault 19, we learned that vault Tech accidentally constructed their vault on a big sulfur geyser. The sulfur smell leaking into the vault ventilation ended up contributing to the vault resident's paranoia. In the final one, the issue was a squeaky office chair given to Carl Maynard. Fix notes, this huge emergency was immediately addressed by our crack engineering team. We ran up to Professor Malleus's office and deployed the fluidic lubrication injector in an effort to stop impending doom from destroying us all. Okay, fine, we oiled up his damn chair. Is this really the kind of crap that's worth submitting a trouble ticket for? <laughs> Well, it looks like Malleus wasn't above getting maintenance to oil his squeaky chair. But then again, he is a professor whose life revolves around sound. Suppose it must have driven him mad. Continuing forward to the west, we see a gas floating around in this room. I wanted to ignite it before I got myself in trouble later. So I backed on out and shot a few blasts from my master blaster. Well, looks like I didn't back out far enough. After we recover, we can open the door to the east where we kill another Mire Alert, and then the path rounds a corner and leads up a staircase to the south. At the end, we find a door that leads to another reactor room. Here we find two doors, one to the east and one to the west. Opening the western door first, we can go down a long hallway until we find an average locked door booby-trapped with a frag mine. After deactivating the mine and unlocking the door, we find ourselves back at the entrance. We see the maintenance hatch leading outside and the doorway to the atrium. 
So at least now we know where this door led. Retracing our steps, we can instead open up the eastern door. Here we see signs, clinic and cafeteria behind us, classroom and equipment room ahead. Down a stairwell, we find an operating room to the left with bloat flies inside. At the end of this hallway is a door to sound testing. And almost immediately, we get attacked by Mirelurks. You like that? We can go south or west. Going south first, we see a sign pointing towards the classroom. The classroom is to the right. And inside, we see a projector still projecting onto a projection screen. But we don't know exactly what film they were projecting. It is presumably lost. Here we find a couple of lockers with some Nuka-Cola. And on the teacher's desk right next to a ruined terminal is Professor Malleus' audio log V9205. The situation is getting out of hand. Over half the population of the vault is exhibiting savage tendencies. We can only assume our noise experimentation has awakened some dormant part of their psyche, brought their primitive nature to the surface. In essence, I feel that they are almost psychologically devolving. I was stupid for rushing these experiments. And now over 35 people are dead. Professor Malleus rightly identifies his experimentation as the source of this apparent psychosis. He blames himself. But as we learned from the Overseer's Terminal, he doesn't fall into despair, but instead rallies the survivors to lead them out of the vault. I wonder if he was successful. From this room, we can open a door to the west, and it looks like we found a practice room. We find music stands and chairs set out, but no soi Stradivarius. Turning around and entering the room directly across the hallway from this one, we find the first chamber to this room mostly empty, but the second chamber to this room has a still functioning terminal on a table surrounded by stim packs. This terminal belonged to Zoe Hammerstein. Could this be a reference to Oscar Hammerstein of Rogers and Hammerstein fame? On the terminal, we find four entries. The first, Zoe's thoughts. It's so wonderful to be surrounded by all this talent. Little old me, who can barely play the violin, is sitting among some of the world's greatest musicians. I still can't believe my luck. Today was great, too. I was able to record an entire symphony, Haydn's Symphony No. 3 in D minor. It was so beautiful, I could barely keep up with everyone else in the string section. But they were so nice, they encouraged me instead of being stuffy jerks or something. Best of all, they record all of it and then let you hear yourself play on the studio's speakers. I can't wait until tomorrow. I hear we're doing a piece from Dvorak. Uh-oh. From this evidence, I think we can conclude that this vault wasn't really to preserve the nation's musical talent. Zoe here even admits that she can't compare to those around her, which makes you wonder why they let her in. I'm thinking that since their nefarious experiment was, of course, the primary purpose of this vault, that they weren't really too picky. Which makes me wonder if Agatha's great-great-grandmother Hilda was all that talented to begin with. Another thing, Zoe mentioned Haydn's Symphony No. 3 in D minor, but Haydn never made a Symphony No. 3 in D minor. He made a Symphony No. 3 in G major. His D minor work was called String Quartet Opus No. 76, which he wrote over 35 years after writing his Symphony No. 3. Now, we could chalk this up to the divergence, but the problem is that the divergence happened in the 1950s, but Haydn wrote his Symphony No. 3 in the 1760s. Either Zoe was so musically inept that she didn't know that Haydn didn't have a Symphony No. 3 in D minor, or in this world he did, and we must conclude that the divergence might have happened in small snapshots before the larger divergence in the 1950s. In the next entry, more of Zoe's thoughts. I've been feeling a little sick lately, kind of woozy after playing in the studio usually. It gets so stuffy in that place, but it's sure worth it. I know I'm getting better just from watching my fellow violinists' techniques. They don't even mind giving me some pointers. Tonight, a bunch of us girls from the string section are gonna go down to the rec hall for a dance. I hope that cute sound guy Parker asks me to dance. He is dreamy. 
Huh, I kind of had the impression that these were all old ladies. She even referred to herself as little old me in the first one, and yet she describes this guy Parker as cute. The next entry says more of Zoe's thoughts, but it's highly misspelled. There's improper capitalization. The words have too many letters. There's a complete lack of punctuation. I'm not feeling very good. I can't concentrate. I went to Dr. Benzion's office, but he just said it's stress and to take it easy for a while. I think all of the time I'm spending in the sound studio is making me tired. I can barely type anymore. I'm shaking so much. Oh no. It looks like Zoe may have been one of the highly impressionable residents of Vault 92. In her last entry, we see evidence of a near-complete transformation. Kulkeep, please, Hef help me. Auj order, follow, help, help me. Lost mind, can't stop them. Get out of my head. This poor woman, who at the very beginning was so happy to be here among artists, among new friends who respected her, even despite her lack of talent, was so excited to dance with Parker in the rec hall. She became one of the crazies. I wonder which of the many skeletons we've seen so far was hers. Backing out of this room and heading south, this pathway loops all the way around the classroom. We see a door to the left, but it's blocked by a shelving unit, and this looks kind of familiar. And then we remember that room beneath the overseer's office. This must be that very room. But wait, we remember hearing a Mirelurk wandering around. Time to be careful moving forward. Rounding the next corner, we can take it to the end where we find a path to the left, but to complete this loop, let's turn right here and explore the small shop or utility room here to the left. We find a toolbox on the counter, a few more boxes behind the counter, some music stands, and one pre-war book on a bookshelf to the west. Heading into the adjoining room to the north, we find a big tool cabinet with scrap metal inside, and a bunch of boxes on the ground covered by some fallen over shelving units. But there's nothing terribly interesting in any of these containers. So that finishes this loop. To continue exploring, let's head out, turn west, and then continue southwest down the hallway. We find a split to the left leading to a lab, but let's follow the path forward to see where it leads. We arrive at a door to the atrium. This brings us out to that final door in the atrium. Here we find another body on the ground. This one looks as if he or she was fleeing before being shot in the back. But now that we know where we are, we can head back to finish exploring the sound testing section. This leaves one path remaining. We we can turn right to go south down the stairway to the lab. At the bottom and rounding the corner, sure enough, we find some mire lurks. Going into the northern room, this may be the rec room that Zoe talked about, or maybe it was the room with the pool table. But here we find a jukebox and some vending machines, a refrigerator with all sorts of snacks, and another pre-war book lying on a table. Heading out and turning right, we see an average locked door to the west. This leads to another storage room. We find some darts on a bottom shelf, a couple of boxes, and then some jet and a stealth boy and some psycho. There are ammunition boxes in the corner, microfusion cells, and against the northern door, an average locked wall safe. Inside, we find almost 200 bottle caps. We can grab the stim packs and railway spikes on the shelf as we walk out, and this leaves one path before us. Rounding the corner to the south, we see that the hallway splits left or right. Let's start by going left, and here we can find the final Mirelurk. In the nearby room, we see a flickering terminal on a table. Directly behind the terminal are two windows which appear to be looking into a practice room or some sort of studio. We see music stands standing up in the dim light. On the table next to this terminal is a copy of Nikola Tesla and Jew, and we find Professor Malleus's audio log V9206. I can't believe what I've discovered. Just before he died. One of the security team members told me everything. The Overseer has been implanting these murderous intentions in the entire vault population without my knowledge. Using the loudspeakers in the dorms instead of just the studios, he subjected everyone to the white noise as they slept. 
He then implanted combat suggestions he claims came from vault Tech itself. He... he must be completely insane. No observation, no controls. I'm going to have to confront him now, and make him pay for what he's done. Half the vault is dead. The other half, fighting for its life. Good luck to all of us. And may God have mercy on our souls. Well, he's not insane. vault really did give the Overseer those instructions. He was following orders. But of course, that doesn't make any of this right. And Professor Malleus is justified to be as incensed as he is. After all, he was played for a fool. On the studio computer, we find four options. The first is to open the recording studio. We see an update. Studio in standby mode. We can then read vault mail number 339. This was from Parker Livingstein, the studio supervisor to the engineering staff. Ah, Parker, this must be the very same fellow who Zoe had a crush on. Hey guys, I'm not sure if this is even worth putting an official trouble ticket in for, but I'm getting some sort of odd pitch overlay on my sound equipment. It's almost like another signal is leaking from maybe the vault intercom network or communications gear and piggybacking on everything I record. It's barely noticeable, but I can definitely see it on my scope. Do we have any cross wiring issues or faulty cable insulation problems on sea level? In the next one, 344, we find a note from Parker to Hilda Egelbrecht. This must be the very same Hilda whose violin we came to retrieve, Agatha's great-great-grandmother. I just wanted to take this opportunity to send you an intra vault mail regarding the wonderful session you performed this afternoon. The sound you coaxed from your Stradivarius is bar none the most haunting, beautiful thing I've heard here to date. I was wondering if perhaps we could get together tomorrow evening and discuss this in a more intimate setting. Uh-oh. Poor old Zoe. Looks like Parker's affections are placed elsewhere. And in the final one, mail 350, we again find a note from Parker to Hilda. But this one is much less formal. Hi, Hildy. Just wanted to send you a quick note. Our session together yesterday was wonderful. I'm glad the studio doors lock, otherwise some of your stuffier fellow musicians might not appreciate how closely you and I work. Make sure when we meet tonight you bring your delicate instrument. Oh, and your violin, too. I have an idea of something we can do with the bow, a new technique I've always wanted to try. Oh, God. That just sounds horribly uncomfortable. Violin bows weren't meant for... that? So, should we tell Agatha about her grandmother, or, uh, kind of keep that one quiet? After all, some things are better left unsaid. But as we arise, we see that by unlocking the door to the studio room, we've powered on the lights. Heading out, going around the corner, and this time going west, we can open up a door to the studio room. And as we do, we disturb a corpse. This body had been leaning against the door. And in his hand was a laser pistol. We see two more corpses here. One sitting in a chair and one lying on the ground. And also, an easy locked wall safe to the south. But inside we don't find anything terribly interesting. It looks as if these two people were having a private recording session. Perhaps these are the remains of Parker and Hilda. After all, we saw in the terminal that Parker and Hilda had planned to meet that night in a private studio room for one of their sessions. It may be that while they were in here cavorting, one of the crazies burst through the door with a laser pistol and killed them. But this doesn't explain how the murderer ended up dying. After all, we don't see any weapons by Parker and Hilda's corpses. You know what would make this even worse is if the person with the gun was Zoe. What if she, in her degenerative state, with her mind long gone, saw Parker and Hilda in this room, and her primal jealousy took over? She burst through the door and murdered them both in cold blood, then, experiencing a brief moment of remorse, turned the gun on herself for killing the man she fancied. But wait, Parker told Hilda to bring her violin. If this is really the corpse of Parker and Hilda, we should find the Soi Stradivarius. And look at that. In the southeastern corner, lying on a table, 
we find a familiar triangular violin-shaped case. Peering through the glass, which is now covered in dust and grime, we see a beautiful red violin. This is the Swa Stradivarius. After looting it, we complete this objective and are now told to return the violin to Agatha. But for now, we can take in the sad sight in the studio room and lament the death of these two lovers who were robbed of a potential lifetime of happiness. On our way out, we can open the only door we have yet to explore. This is the door to the west that we saw first upon entry when we instead chose to visit the atrium. Opening the door, we find a proximity mine on the ground, which we must deactivate, and we can go down a long hallway to open a door which leads to the reactor section of the vault. So had we gone this way first instead of the atrium, we would have walked through the knee-deep water. But since we've already done this, we can turn around and exit Vault 92 with the confidence that we leave the place fully explored. As was to be expected, the story of Vault 92 is a horrible one. But is it even possible? Are humans really that sensitive to unconscious conditioning? This plot hinges on the idea that while people sleep, their subconscious can be programmed to do something as extreme as murder simply by hearing instructions over and over again. Well, there's plenty of evidence that people's opinions and behaviors can be influenced by subliminal messaging. For example, in 1999, researchers North, Hargreaves, and McKendrick experimented on wine sales using music. When researchers played German music in a wine store, German wine outsold the French wine. But on days when they played French music in the wine store, French wine outsold the German wine. The scenario we see going on here in Vault 92 is pretty outlandish, but subliminal priming is a real thing. Researchers believe that it's because we evolved to enjoy things that we're more familiar with. We greatly prefer to see faces we've seen before as opposed to faces we've never seen before. We're more likely to trust people we see on a daily basis than strangers we're meeting for the very first time. This is why companies will spend big bucks not to give you a sale, a coupon, a discount, or any other incentive to buy from them, but just to tell you their name, to show you their logo, to make themselves familiar to you. As human beings, we gravitate towards, we're more attracted to things that we're familiar with. Is it possible that the subconsciouses of these people in Vault 92 became so familiar with the ideas of violence and murder that over time it became so attractive to them that it created within them an insatiable desire, an overwhelming urge that trumped all other reason? Clearly, in this world, it did. Now that we have the Swa Stradivarius, we need to deliver it to its rightful owner, Hilda's sole heir, her great-great-granddaughter, Agatha. But we don't have to. There are many ways to end this quest. We can give this violin to two other people, whom we can interact with in four different ways. Agatha will have different responses depending upon our choices, which is why we must save the ending of this questline for a dedicated video. If you want to make sure you don't miss the final episode in this series, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook where I announce any changes to my production schedule. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with episode 4.